Hey everyone, a very warm welcome back to the channel. Today we are discussing the question number 14 from the chapter of AOD, Monotonicity and Maximum Minima. The question is asking us to find the range of f of x if f of x is defined as a function, a uh, greatest integer function of negative of 2 power x plus 2 power 1 by x. And it is given that the domain of the function is negative numbers uh, from minus infinity to 0. So the maximum time allotted for this question would be 25 minutes. And ideally, you should try to do it within 11 minutes. And it is quite an amazing problem. So I would highly recommend you all to give it a try. So I hope you all have tried it out. Now let's have a look at the correct solution. So the answer to this question is surprisingly just one single element, which is minus one. So the range is just minus one. So f of x is identically equal to minus one. So concepts and formulas used are pretty standard. Method of critical points and sign scheme, we should know. Derivative, if it changes sign from negative to positive, then it represents a point of minima we should know. And derivative less than zero implies uh, or indicates that uh, indicates the decreasing nature of function f of x. Now, let's see how to actually solve the question. So putting in a few values of x like uh, minus one, minus half, you will, etc. We can lead, uh, it would lead us to the conjecture that probably f of x is identically minus one, right? The reason is, uh, if you find f of minus one, that also comes out to be minus one. If you put f of minus half, if you find that also com comes out to be minus one. So if you uh, put in a few values, you might be able to observe that greatest integer of that quantity always is coming out to be minus one. So let's just uh, claim or have a uh, make a conjecture that f of x is identically minus one, which is possible if and only if the expression inside of the uh, inside of the greatest integer if it lies from minus one to zero, right? The reason is if you want the greatest integer of anything to be exactly minus one, it should obviously be greater than equal to minus one, but strictly less than zero, like minus half minus three by four, then only it is possible for it to be, uh, to have a greatest integer of minus one for all X less than zero, because domain of F is given to be negative numbers. Now, clearly this inequality is going to be obviously true because two power anything is always going to be positive. This also positive. So positive number with a negative sign obviously would be negative or less than zero. So no doubt about this inequality. Now, how about, how do we deal with this second inequality? This is the only inequality that we are now concerned with and we have to prove. So the other inequality will, uh, will become this inequality, which we are calling as uh, inequality number one. The reason is I have just transposed this to the left hand side. So obviously this uh, inequality becomes uh, as uh, the inequality number one. Now, how to prove this inequality? So let us just assume this function to be g of x. Now, if this is what we have assumed, then obviously we would uh, need to find the derivative of this. The reason is less than or equal to zero simply means that we have to show that its maximum value would be zero. So as, uh, as far as maximum or minimum or such kind of inequalities are concerned, the only hope for us is using uh, differentiation or monotonicity and all these concepts. So we are finding g prime x derivative we are finding, and this is what we are getting. We are equating that to zero in order to find the critical points of g of x. So if I equate it to zero, this is the equation that I get. The reason is this will go to this side and out of this x square, one of the x I have cross multiplied and taken it to the left hand side. The remaining thing remains on the right hand side. Now, unfortunately, x into two power x is not one one in the given domain. Otherwise, we could have directly sa said that x equal to one by x, right? Because if this is the, let's say h of x, then h of x equal to h of one by x uh, is this equation that is written. But unfortunately, this is not uh, you know, uh, a one, one function. So any conclusion from here wouldn't be possible. And hence this method fails. So then what to do? So then comes the correct method. The method would be T equal to minus X. We need to put since X is obviously negative in the domain. T would obviously be greater than zero because negative of negative would be uh, positive. So the inequality number one would become this because I have just put X as minus T, right? So this is the uh, expression that we are getting. And I can now write it as one upon two power t plus one upon two power one by t. Then I'm taking LCM and getting this quantity, which I have to prove less than or equal to one cross multiplication that I can do. So look, we are saying this inequality will be true if and only if this is true, which is true if and only if this is true. And then what I'm doing is uh, I'm just bringing this portion to this side. Okay. So let's call this A, let's call this B and let's call this A into B. So what I'm doing is 
I am bringing this uh, this thing on the left hand side. I am transposing it to the right hand side so that it becomes minus a plus b, and then plus a b is already there. And this we want to prove greater than or equal to zero. So what I am doing is I am just adding a one to both sides, and this can easily be factorized as one minus a into one minus b, or a minus one into a minus b, which is precisely what I have written. And this one also I have brought or transposed to the left hand side so that. This is the inequality number two that we are getting. So what we are saying is that inequality one will be true if and only if this is true, which will be true if and only if necessary and sufficient condition. If this is true, this will be true if and only if this is true, and this will be true if and only if this final inequality number two is true. So if we are just able to prove that uh, inequality two holds, then our job is done. So let us just define h of t to be this quantity, right? This function we have assumed as h of t. h prime t we are going to find it comes out to be this function minus this function. Uh, it is very basic. We are just using product rule and chain rule to differentiate this. So once we differentiate, we now wish to find critical points of h of t obviously by solving for h prime t is equal to zero. So if we do that, ln two and ln two will get cancelled out and this goes on the other side if we are trying to solve this equation h prime t equal to zero. So this is the uh, basically this is the uh, uh, equation that we are getting that this thing is equal to this thing, uh, this entire thing, right? So and ln two ln two gets cancelled. But now comes the uh, best part or something that we should be able to think the most difficult part probably, and that part is that uh, one of the t's we cross multiply, right? So on this side, what will be remaining? So what we are trying to basically say is that uh, I am dividing by two power one by t, and I am dividing by two power t. Okay. So let me just explain once again what is being done here exactly. So this we are dividing it by this quantity, right? So that it becomes two power one by t minus one, two power one by t minus one upon two power one by t. Upon two power one by t, no problem still here, and we are also dividing by this quantity. So here it becomes two power t minus one upon two power t, two power t minus one upon two power t, right? Now what we are doing with this t square is I am letting one t remain here only, which is precisely present here also in equation number three. But the other t I am cross multiplying, and that I am writing as one upon one by t because it can obviously be written as one upon one by t. So that's what I have written it as now. If we define p of t to be the function two power t minus one upon t into two power t, equation three obviously becomes p of one by t equal to p of t. The reason is if this is p of t, it is very easy to observe this left hand side would simply be p of one by t. Everywhere we, where we had you know t, it has been converted into one by t. So that's the reason why. Uh, this is what the equation becomes. Equation number three, p of t equal to p of one by t. Now. If we find p prime t, then it obviously comes out to be this quantity. I have just applied the quotient rule and nothing else. So if we apply the quotient rule, uh, p prime t comes out to be this quantity, and then we can just uh, cancel out a few terms like two power t can come common and two power t can come common, and it can uh, cancel out one of the two power t's from the denominator. So on simplifying and rearranging. This is the expression for p prime t that we are getting. It is very easy to differentiate. Absolutely uh, simple MOD principles we have used. Now p prime t we are easily able to observe that the denominator is positive, right? Because t square is positive, two power anything is positive. So we are now going to consider just the numerator of this function, which we are calling as q of t. So let's just consider this function. So it is easy to observe that q prime t comes out to be this quantity. We can just differentiate it, right? Uh, derivative of this would be ln two, and its derivative would be uh, two part into ln two. So ln two comes out common, and this is the quantity that we are getting. But since t was greater than zero, two part t would be greater than two part zero, which is one. So one minus two part t would be less than zero. So this is a negative quantity. Ln two is obviously positive. Uh, because two is greater than one, so this product would obviously be negative or less than zero because of this being negative. For all positive t, this is going to hold true, right? Now, that means q t is a decreasing function because its derivative was less than zero. But if it is a decreasing function, then for all positive t or t greater than zero, we can say that 
qt would be greater than or less than q of 0 because it is a decreasing function basically sign of inequality will get changed and that's precisely what we have done here so q of t would be less than q0 but it is very obvious to uh, to have a look that q of 0 would come out to be 0 the reason is 0 into ln 2 is 0 and 2 power 0 is 1 1 minus 1 is 0 so q0 is actually 0 so qt actually comes out to be less than 0 right but if this numerator comes out to be negative or less than zero, it means that p prime t would obvious uh, would also be less than zero because its numerator was less than zero and denominator was denominator was any way positive. So that is the reason why negative upon positive becomes negative again. So we can say that p of t is a monotonically strictly decreasing function because its derivative is less than zero and thus one one because any monotonic function is always going to be a one one function. So the equation three p of t equal to p of one by t would imply that t is equal to one by t. The reason is for t greater than zero, a uh, one by t would always would also be greater than zero. So t and one by t are both in the same uh, same domain or in the same uh, you know uh, value or in the same uh, interval in which for which we have proved this entire thing that p of t is a one one function. So since t is greater than zero, one by t is also greater than zero. So uh, p of a equal to p of b would imply a equal to b since it is a one one function. So that is the reason why we have been able to say that t equal to one by t in place of one by t had it been minus one by t then we couldn't have done this because then it would not have been greater than zero and one one we have only proved for numbers or arguments inside the function which are greater than zero okay so that's why i'm emphasizing this point that in the interval or domain where we have proven it to be one one there only we can apply that property right so t equal to one by t is what we would get uh, cross multiplying t square is equal to 1, t equal to plus minus 1, but obviously we are only going to consider consider t equal to 1 because we are only consider, uh, interested in considering t greater than 0. So that is precisely the reason why we can say this is the only root of h of t. Now what is h of t? Uh, so here it is, h of t I think we have defined here. So this was h of t, right? So basically what we are saying is, uh, the reason we are able to say that h of t would have exactly uh, t equal to 1 is the only root of h of t. Uh, so rather, we can actually say that uh, t equal to 1 would be the only root of h prime t actually, right? Uh, let me let me correct this. Here we have h prime. Why is it the only root? Because we had actually set out with this equation only, right? h prime t equal to 0. From there, we had obtained the uh, equation number 1, uh, equation number 3. And the equation number 3, we have been able to show, would only have t equal to 1 as its root. So h prime t would have only one root, which is t equals to 1. And now what we are going to do is h prime 2 we are going to find. Why are we finding h prime 2? So look, when we are going to draw the sign scheme of h prime, we know that it has got, got only one root, which is one, right? So between zero and one, we'll try to find its sign anywhere. And from one to infinity, we'll try to find its sign somewhere or anywhere, right? Whatever sign comes at that point will remain throughout the interval because that is the method of critical points, right? So we find h prime two, that comes out to be this quantity. And on further simplifying, this becomes this. Uh, root 2 is approximately 1.414. So 13 into that quantity would give us a quantity which is uh, easily greater than 16. We can easily verify that 19.2 something we'll get. So this is a positive quantity. So since add 2 it is positive, so throughout this interval, h prime would remain positive. Similarly, h prime half we find, which comes out to be this quantity, which easily we can see is going to be less than zero because this is going to become 16 minus 13 root 2, the complete opposite of what we had earlier obtained. So this is going to be negative here at half. So throughout this interval, it is going to be negative. So that's why the sign scheme of h prime t is going to look like this. So with this in mind, we can easily observe that h of t would attain its local as well as global minima at the point t equals to one for all t greater than zero. The reason is, uh, First it was decreasing, then it becomes horizontal and then it continuously increases. So obviously uh, one is going to be the point of not only local as but uh, but also global minima for t greater than zero. So thus we can say that, uh, uh, okay, one more thing now, h of one is zero. Why is it zero? So the reason is that uh, this was h of t, right? This was what we had defined h of t. So if you, uh, or not this, this actually, 
just after this second inequality. So if you just put in uh, t equals to one, what are we getting? Uh, two power one minus one into two power one upon one minus one minus one. It easily you can uh, see and observe that it comes out to be zero. So one into one minus one, it is zero. So since h of one is equal to zero, what can we say? We can say that h of t would always be greater than or equal to zero for all positive t. The reason is uh, the function h of x or h of t would attain its minimum value at t equals to one. So whatever this value it is, any other value would be greater than or equal to this. That is the definition of minimum. So that's why we can say that h of t would be greater than or equal to zero always. And this is precisely where we have proved, uh, where we have been able to prove that uh, uh, we have been able to prove about uh, inequality number two. This inequality we have proven because this is h of t greater than or equal to zero only, right? So that's what we have proven. But this will be true if and only if the inequality number one is true and if this is true that would imply that this original claim or conjecture was true and thus we can say that since this quantity or the function inside of greatest integer always lies between minus one and zero uh, the greatest integer value would always be equal to minus one and thus we can say the conjecture is proven so quite a, a roller coaster of a question i would say you know a lot of uh, things we have to think about and uh, amazing techniques going on in this question. So I really hope you all liked it. Make sure you like the video, comment down below what more you'd like to see next, uh, share it with a friend, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you all in the next one.